Islam had extended its reach from Spain all the way to the edge of India. At its heart was a fabled city of wealth. It was called Baghdad. The palaces of ancient Baghdad have been lost over the centuries. All the exquisite neighborhoods covered with parks, gardens, villas, and beautiful promenades. Baghdad was the center of learning in the Islamic world, and all major innovations either came from Baghdad or quickly came to Baghdad because the best people came to Baghdad, the best thinkers, the best uh, philosophers, uh, the best artists. The best minds rose to the call. The finest were welcomed at a center of scholarship, Baghdad's renowned House of Wisdom. It was a magnet for scholars and intellectuals who came um, and worked in the academies. There were public libraries associated with the palace, and scholars came from all over the empire. And there were scholars from Iran. Unlike their Christian counterparts, Muslim thinkers saw no insurmountable contradiction between their faith and the laws governing the natural world. So they embraced Aristotle and Plato, writers the Christian church considered blasphemous. So this is the time when we begin to see scientists, bureaucrats, what have you, going and seeking from whatever civilization that had any sciences before, be it the Greek, be it the Indian, be it the Persian and so on. From the Hindus came mathematical concepts that guide us today. It was the scholars of the House of Wisdom who developed the system of Arabic numerals, still in use. It is they who translated and transformed the writings of the Greeks and made a gift of them to the modern Western world. The Renaissance had its beginnings in Baghdad. Having amassed the knowledge, the Muslims now began to challenge it. This was perhaps their most important contribution. The scientific process was born. They wanted to know why a very intelligent Greek scientist, whose text they were just admiring and they were verifying it, why would he make a mistake in the first place? So they began to dig, was it because he didn't have the right instruments or is it because he didn't have the right methodology to use the instruments for the verifications of observation? Algebra and trigonometry, engineering and astronomy, countless disciplines integral to our lives today trace their roots to Islamic scientists. More surprising perhaps were their innovations in medicine. At a time when Europeans were praying to the bones of their saints to cure their illnesses, Muslim physicians developed an innovative theory that disease was transmitted through tiny airborne organisms, the precursor to the study of germs. They determined that sick patients should be quarantined and then treated. This is the basis of the institution most fundamental to medicine today the hospital. Funded mainly through religious endowments, Muslim hospitals had separate wards for patients suffering from different kinds of disease. Even mental illness was treated. Their studies of anatomy were so sophisticated that they remained in use by Muslim and European physicians for 600 years. The father of optics was a Muslim named Ibn al-Haytham. His work with lenses eventually led to the invention of the modern camera. He produced the first treatise that ventured to explain how the eye actually sees. A thousand years before the West dared to take up the practice, Muslim doctors were removing cataracts surgically. 
clearing them from the eye with a hollow needle. But for all this knowledge to transform and illuminate an empire, it had to be copied and shared across a hundred different cities in the Islamic world. For this, there was a new invention, one that is still fundamental to learning and knowledge today. Paper. Around the year 700, 750, when Muslim armies reached Central Asia, they encountered paper for the first time. And very quickly, the Muslim bureaucracy um, started using paper. You find that, you know, within 50 years, it's in Syria, and then a few years after that, it's in, it's in Egypt, and then it's in North Africa, and then it's in, in Sicily, and then it's in Spain, and that's where Europe learned to make paper from. With the wide use of books and paper, hundreds of scribes, some of whom were women, were kept busy transcribing the translations and new writings of the Baghdad scholars. We know, for example, that there was a street of booksellers um, with more than a hundred shops, each one with paper and books for sale. Um, and this is a time when, you know, in uh, Europe, a monastery would be lucky if it had five or ten books. While the monks of the West were hoarding their wisdom on scraps of expensive parchment, paper enabled Islamic civilization to spread its newfound knowledge far and wide, creating a single community linking three continents. In all the broad empire, there was one place the Christian world could experience the lifestyle Muslims now took for granted. Southern Spain, during the Dark Ages, this was the most prosperous and sophisticated metropolis on the continent. It had street lights and paved roads, libraries, hospitals and palaces. This was a city of light, a Muslim city. The city of Cordoba in the 9th and 10th centuries was one of the biggest and most exciting in Europe. We have descriptions of it by people coming and saying, all these flowers everywhere, this, this open streets, this, this wonderful light coming down. Uh, northern cities were dark. Cordoba had running water. People lived in big houses. In contrast, in Paris, people lived in shacks by the side of the river. Many, many people came to visit it to view the wonders of the mosque which had rib vaulting, the kind of vaulting which is like this and which 100 years later by a mere coincidence you might think, but not at all a coincidence, appears in the Gothic cathedrals of Northern Europe, in Lincoln Cathedral, in Chartres Cathedral in France, where does that come from? Obviously, influenced by the great mosque of Cordoba in the south of Spain. As Europeans made their way from the cold stone of their northern castles into the glorious Muslim cities of southern Spain, they couldn't help but be impressed. In the green hills above Granada was a palace of startling elegance a shining example of the richness and sophistication Islam brought to medieval Europe. It is called the Alhambra. The Alhambra is perhaps the most famous example of, of, of Islamic architecture to, to most Westerners. It is the, the best remaining example of what a medieval Muslim palace would have looked like. Here, the Muslim elite relished the good life. Reposing on lush carpets, surrounded by perfume and music, the privileged few debated the nature of God, the subtleties of Greek philosophy, or the most recent mathematical revelations from India, while they dined on spiced delicacies served on Chinese porcelains. They strolled the grounds through gardens irrigated by complex gravity-fed water systems, 